Nothing beats winning at sport and then celebrating afterwards. My team, Manchester United, won the Premier League again this year. And last Monday, hundreds of thousands of fans from all over the world came to the streets of Manchester to join the parade and celebrate, to be there in the moment. You can see just how much it meant to them from their body language, from their gestures and from their facial expressions. It was special. Sadly, I couldn't be there. But one of my friends was lucky enough to get there. And she sent me a text and it said, wish you were here. And that really got to me. Sometimes we forget just how important it is to be there. Um, and we often just slip into our digital bubbles. Does this look familiar? You're landing um, on the runway and you've been chatting to the person next to you, having a nice conversation with a stranger. And then suddenly you both whip out your mobile phone, desperate to get those missed tweets, emails and texts. It's as if you'd never um, had a conversation, gone in an instant. You don't even smile to say goodbye. Well, it doesn't just happen on planes. It also happens in restaurants and in parks and also in our own homes. And here you see a family. They may be sitting together in the living room, but they're all using their own devices. Even the pet dog has got her snout in her own tablet. <laughs> and then in the most beautiful places, like this Japanese garden in spring, this couple should be looking fondly into each other's eyes, being romantic, but no, what they're doing is they're totally immersed in their own mobile devices, oblivious of the other one. So we can live in our digital bubbles, as I've shown you, um, and seemingly being together, whether it's strangers or family or lovers. But in truth, that's not the case. And it's not just mobiles, but also we have data that is streaming at us about our bodily functions. There are not lots of devices that are coming out, like wearable devices that will tell you how stressed you are, how many steps you've taken. And there are um, shoes that will tell you how lazy you are. And we all know that in a few weeks time, there are going to be some augmented glasses that will tell you how many calories there are in that food, in that bun in front of you, and tell you whether you can eat it or not. Do we really want to be in this world where we are just in this technological trance? Well, you have a choice. You can either be continue retreating into your mindless um, digital bubble, or you can be connected with others being there. How can we bridge the gap between mindless isolation and mindful connection such that it's meaningful? And the trick is to think about how we can use and design digital technology to connect more when we're together. And if we can do that, we can do all sorts of things. We can enhance um, life, we can um, amplify cognition, we can extend what we do. And I'm going to show you some examples of what happens when you do that. And one way in which we can do that is simply by sharing our devices. So here you see teenagers who are learning together by sharing one tablet, and one person takes a turn and then the other. We've all done that when we looked at photos, sharing them together, just how much that means to you. But we can also think of other ways. And one way in which we can do that is to have different devices, but you have to use them together in order to collaborate. And one project I started in 2000 was looking at how we could get kids to take their own initiative in learning and be excited by learning. And what we did was we wired up some woodland nearby to where we were working. A team of psychologists, designers, and computer scientists came together and put all sorts of devices into this woodland. And we got pairs of 12-year-olds to go out there and discover for themselves to do scientific inquiry and have a field trip with a difference. And two of the devices we gave to them, one of them was a probe and another was a, a digital display. And each of the devices did different things. And what we wanted them to do was to come together using these. So one device you can see here was intended to support curiosity. And what it does, it's a handcrafted probe device where you probe something and it will give you a reading of how light it is and the moisture. 
So this kid will go probing, but he doesn't know what the result is. But this kid over here has the mobile display, and on it, simple visualizations of those probes um, are, are appearing. So you can see at the top how light, and below it, how much moisture. And you can see his puzzled face looking over to his friend, thinking about it. Well, what happens when they come together? And here's two boys that are coming together, and you can see on their faces sheer delight. The one on the right, Aaron, has put the probe device under his armpit. <laughs> and Felix on the left can't believe just how damp his armpit is, as you can see <laughs> by the sheer level of moisture there. These boys just really had fun. We couldn't stop them probing everything. They wanted to find the wettest, the lightest, the driest, the darkest. And what's more was that they came up with hypotheses before they looked at the reading as to what might be wet and why. They did um, scientific inquiry in the wild. And as I said, we just couldn't stop them probing. 10, 12 years on, I've met Felix. And he came up to me and he said, you know, one of the most memorable days at school was that day you took us into the ambient wood. That speaks volumes. But it's not just um, children that we can think about how we give them devices to share when they're together. We can think of everyone of all ages. And here we have three women who are retired in their late 60s. And what we did was we gave them uh, an inventor's toolkit, some of you might know, which is called Makey Makey. And we wanted them to think about what they could do um, with it. And what they did was they created um, a musical system whereby uh, with the Makey Makey kit, you have input devices that you use everyday objects around. And here they're using bananas, potatoes, courgettes, cucumbers, celery, and so on. And these represent keys. So the banana could be a C, the potato a B, and the cucumber an A. And what these three women are doing is that they're playing tunes together and they're making a circuit. So you see one of them holding the arm of the other to complete the circuit. So one will squeeze the, the potato to play the C and another will squeeze the plum to play the A. And they played all sorts of tunes, including Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. <laughs> At first they said, this is a bit childish, it's not really for us. But you can see on their faces just how much fun it was to be playful and to do things like this. And then afterwards, we couldn't stop them talking about technology, about the possibilities, about being creative. It's OK if you're 60, 70, 80, 90 to be playful and use these types of um, technologies. So what else can we do? Perhaps we can go up another level to the community and think about how we can get a, a galvanize a community to do things together when they are together. And this is what we did with the Tidy Street project in Brighton, which is where I live. We thought about how we could get the community involved. And the project we were interested in was how can we get them to reduce their energy consumption. And rather than just think about individual families or householders about how they reduce their electricity and giving them smart meters, we got the whole street involved. And this is a typical house in Brighton, which is terraced. So they live um, quite close to each other. So what we did was we asked them to read their electricity meters and then put it into the, the reading each day into a web um, application that we'd built. And with that information, we were able to average how much the street was using. And they could see how much electricity they were using relative to the rest of the street. They could also see how much they were using re relative to the rest of the city, Brighton, and even the rest of the world, even Barcelona. Now, the real innovation wasn't that, but it was putting a graph onto the road. And you can see on here, we got a graffiti artist, and every day he sprayed what the average was relative to Brighton. And the people in the houses came out, and they talked to each other about this. But they didn't just talk to each other about how they were changing their own habits. They talked to passers-by about it, and those passers-by talked to other people in, in the city, and those people talked to others. And it just went viral. Everyone thought this is a great way of sharing information. And we had a documentary maker from New York come all the way, Gary Huswit, to make a video of this. And I hope this works, because what he shows is very powerful. We're interested in making people more aware of their patterns of behavior so that potentially they can change them. 
In this project, we were interested in electricity usage. We actually went for a very low-tech method of recording electricity usage. So rather than using smart sensors, each day we got the participants onto Heidi Street to go down to their electricity meter, note down the reading, and then they went to our website and they'd put that number in. We were interested in doing a public display, so we decided that we would turn the street, essentially, into a big graph. On the street, we show how the average usage of the participants compares to the Brighton average. It's 500 feet long, we record it for three weeks, and each day we show how they compare. So if you're looking down the street, you can see how their electricity usage has changed over time. It's woken us up. I'm not very technological, was it? So I did my best, and I'm try to unplug things and so on, but it has made us very conscious of what we, you know, what we use, what we waste. It wasn't really so much about the numbers as where your wiggly line was going in relation to the street's wiggly line. Seeing the information graphically really focused you into thinking about things that you leave on, that you don't need to. Mine was quite high, so I needed to, in the community spirit, try and get that down rather than bring the street average up and above. Um, so I started changing the way I did things. One other piece of technology that we gave the participants was um, an appliance meter. I think that was really important for them because once they got an idea of how their overall electricity was changing, they then wanted to identify which particular appliances were, were using more electricity. We'd see just how greedy some of the devices we had in the house were. Halogen lighting, very, very greedy. Uh, television, not so bad. The kettle, you know, we have to ration the number of cups of tea that we have every day uh, because uh, it uses up so much electricity. But it does make you very aware of what you're using. Everybody that walked by, you could see them examining the street art, trying to understand what it was. There was a lot of conversation that went on in the street. You know, when you met something, you were always talking about the project. And when we were people were walking down on a Saturday, they wanted to talk about the project. So I think it genuinely raised the profile, having this thing in the road. Over the first three weeks of the project, the average electricity usage of the participants came down by 15%. So it's promising, and we're hoping that that change will be sustained. I thought about energy usage in general, but I hadn't thought about how I would change my behaviour. I didn't do anything about it. By participating in the project, what it did was just made me act on it as opposed to think nice thoughts about perhaps doing something. The main lessons we can learn about sustainability from this project is that although it starts with individuals, a really important factor in people's behavior is their community. People are influenced by what other people are doing around them. So if you can engage them as a community, they seem to be more motivated and more likely to change their behavior. So to conclude, technology is going to continue to proliferate and it doesn't mind how you use it. You can continue to retreat into your digital bubbles, looking at your um, uh, phones and having um, mindless interactions, or you can be more mindful of others and the environment around you. Mindless or mindful, the choice is yours. Thank you. <laughs>